Hello, my name is Vincent, and you might be wondering why I'm wearing headphones for a painting video. Well, we're painting the Gene Steeler cult character, Clamavus, here at Bunker 6. Thank you for joining me for this painting video. Now, before we get started on painting Clamavus, the key propagandist of the Gene Stealer cult, we of course need to prime the model and then do some overall airbrushing of a base coat that's going to be the majority of the model. In this case, Mechanica Standard Grey. And once we've got that out of the way, we're going to be moving on to all of the other base coat colors that are required on this model. We're going to be starting with the largest areas, which is the red fabric, and we're going to be doing that in corn red. Bearing in mind, all Games Workshop base colours are quite thick, so make sure you water them down about 50-50 with water. You don't necessarily need to do the step of blocking out the book in black, but I decided to do that prior to painting it with Rhinox Hide. And aside from the book, we of course need to address all the other black leather parts of the model. And once you've got the boots and everything else out of the way that require black, we're going to now move on to the leather-bound book in the actual base colour that I want to paint it in, which is Rhinox Hide. The black just makes it a little bit more fuller when you're doing a dark colour, like we're doing here with the brown. And to keep the variety and spice up on this model, we're going to be painting a different brown for some of the other leather areas. In this instance, we're going to be using Mornfang Brown for the backpack, the pouch, and the gun holsters on this model. Now, interestingly enough, we're going to be using Nuln Oil to shade the Mornfang Brown sections rather than Agrax Earthshade. I was doubtful of this process, but actually once I did it, I was very impressed. Now we're doing the standard process of the blue fabric for the Gene Stealer Colt here. In this instance, we're going to be base coating with Dark Reaper, and then we're going to be moving up to Thunderhawk Blue, and then highlighting with Fenrisian Grey in later steps. Now, although these base coat stages can be quite rudimental and dull to watch through a video, it's very important when you're working on these stages to remember that each paint has a different quality and consistency to it. For example, the Dark Reaper is going to come out a little bit more thinly than, say, a darker Rhinox Hide paint. And in this instance with Bugman's Glow, when you're putting it straight over a black primer, it can be quite unnerving at first to see that the paint isn't going on evenly. But let each layer dry and trust the process, and after a few coats, the paint should be flat and lovely to work with. Now a little secret I have for reds is I add this transparent red from Vallejo, which is basically like an airbrush paint, and it makes the red really, really rich, and I think it's much nicer for it. Doesn't look exactly like the box art, but I prefer the depth and richness of this red because of adding this layer. Now we're going to be moving on to this little blue button. This is the only time we're going to be using this paint, so we're just getting it out of the way right now. Also you'll notice a white button that was painted with pale sand by Vallejo Model Color. Now we're going to be using a colour that I use all the time for these jean stealers, and it is Brassy Brass. It's a really nice base coat tone that I like for these metallics. We'll eventually move into more yellowy golds like Retributor Gold and Elven Gold by Scale Colour later on, but this is a really nice starting point for the gold sections on this model. And apologies if you've heard this a million times before due to being an early subscriber to this channel, but here we go again. If you're working in metallics, always make sure you use a different pot to wash your paintbrush with. And if you're old or easily distracted like I am, then you might want to make sure that you get all of your metallic phase done in one go, so you don't have to think about coming back to metallics later on and forgetting to use the correct wash pot or anything like that, and accidentally getting any of those metallic flakes in your regular paints. And if you can, try and avoid using one of your good brushes for these metallics, because the metal flakes can apparently damage the bristles. And if you're a complete amateur like me, then this is a great stage because of course it does a lot of the work of making your paint job look a bit more fancier than it actually is. Of course, if you are a non-metallic metal person, this is complete blasphemy. Now at this point, I've pretty much got all of the base coat colors that I require, so we're going to be moving on to some of the shade or wash sections. Now, if you're new to this, of course, washing is where you're basically trying to add some shade and contrast to the nooks and crannies, so you don't actually have to go in there with a darker color paint, which can be much more time consuming. Now you can actually see that my brush is pretty loaded up here with wash, but you might want to take it a little bit more of a softly, softly approach. But because I'm quite used to these washes, I know what the consistency is going to be like. But always make sure that you don't have any paint pooling and let it dry before you start moving any further paint around on the model. Because sometimes you might end up with tearing and that can really, really mess up a paint job. And this is the easiest part of the tutorial, which is the Agrax Earthshade, where we're going to be going over the body panels, the fabrics, and everything else pretty much, apart from the red sections, because this is where we want to make the model feel uniform. And by putting this overall wash, or also known as a filter, on the model, we really get a nice even finish once it's dried. 
while the Agrax Earthshade is drying, we're going to be moving over to the Reichlin Flesh Shade layer, where we're going to be adding that to the skin sections. Now you just want to make sure you're getting it into all the nooks and crannies, like the gaps between the fingers and the bottom and the back of the neck. And when you're doing these washes, just make sure that you're being very aware of the fact that you want to be pulling the end of a brush stroke towards the darkest point of where you want the paint to be, because that is where the paint pigment is going to be focused the most, at the end of a brush stroke. Now I decided that after I'd finished all of my washes that I would do the highlight section for the yellow, just using real yellow on the pipes, and then of course we're going to be adding the caution black stripes at the end of the video. Now quite early on I have a pretty solid plan of how I want to do things because of course the base coats are very important, but after that when it comes to the highlighting and cleanup, things can get a little bit random and sporadic. As you'll probably see in this video, I don't really have any particular rhyme or reason for the reasons why I'm doing things, but I hope you can follow along nonetheless. And talking about following along, I've gone from a highlighting section all the way back down to a panel line accent section. But this is what can happen sometimes. While I was recording the video, I actually noticed there was this very aggressive brown line that didn't look like it was being done by a wash. So I pulled out my Rhinox hide and attempted to add the panel line directly, and it looks pretty close to the box art now. Where would any real amateur Warhammer paint to be without Noln Oil? I don't know, probably in a ditch somewhere, but I've got my Noln Oil out as requested by the Games Workshop color app, and I'm adding it generously to the Mornfang brown layer from earlier on. And I'm actually very impressed with how it looks. I would have assumed that you would have gone with an Agrax Urshade because of course it's brown going on brown, but actually no, it gives you a kind of oily finish and it looks really nice once it's dried. Now we're going to be moving over to the tome that our Clamavus here is standing on, probably some awful filthy propaganda that he hasn't spouted through his audible virus machine yet, but we're not here for that, we're here to paint the pages of it. And of course there's two ways of doing it, the easy way and the hard way. I decided to do it the hard way, but let me quickly explain the easy way. Just paint the whole page section in a bone colour, then let that dry, add an Agrax Earthshade, then go back in with a base colour again, the, preferably the one that you just used for the base colour earlier on, and then add some highlights with either a white or a very light white bone colour. Then you should be done. But I decided to use the black as my shade, and that's why I was going in manually painting all the pages, and as you can see with the stark contrast between the black and the white, it's quite extreme and does the job nicely. I had the Agrax Earthshade just to make the pages look a little bit older. And at this point I knew that the Agrax Earthshade for the rest of the model was definitely dry, so I was doing what I mentioned earlier, which is going in now doing some of the cleanup. We're just using the base colour over the wash, and just removing any of the wash where we don't want it, preferably on high flat surface areas where no shade would be cast. And I'm sure it goes without saying, but try and avoid getting any of that cleanup paint into the shaded sections you've already worked on. And the main focal blue that we're going to be using is Thunderhawk blue, and we're going to be focusing our attention on the top of the legs and the big chunky folds and creases in the fabric. If you're new to this hobby and all these kind of things look a little bit intimidating, just remember less is more. You don't have to do these steps, you can just pull areas that are raised, like the creases around the top of the boot of the fabric, and just paint those in a lighter colour, so you don't have to get too crazy into the blending if you don't want to, but it's always good to try something new. Once I was satisfied with the blue fabric sections of the model, I moved my attention over to the light leather sections. Now I moved straight in with a light scrag brown, rather than doing clean up with the Mornfang brown of our base coat colour earlier, because the Noln Oil was sitting quite nicely, I didn't think it required too much clean up actually. And as you can see, I'm just making sure that I'm pulling the paint towards the area where I want it to be the lightest, in the areas where that is required. And in this instance, those areas are going to be the bottom of the pouch, the top of the pouch opening, and all of the hard edges of the pistol holster. I then moved over to creating some even more extreme highlights by mixing Cadian Flesh Tone in with the Scrag Brown. Now we're going to be focusing our attention into smaller areas rather than the broad side sections of an edge highlight, and then focusing in on the corners more and more the brighter we go. The brightness is going to be added by using the Cadian Flesh Tone, but we're going to make sure that we don't get so bright that things start looking pink. But that really, really bright spot can be fine as long as you keep it as a spot. You want your brightest point to be the narrowest or smallest point of a highlight, generally speaking. Unless, of course, you're doing some portrait work or you're working on a bust or something like that. But in this case, all of those brightest points need to be the smallest points. Decided to move over to the edge highlighting of the blue fabric. In this instance, we're going to be using Fenrisian Grey. I do actually end up using a blend of Fenrisian Grey and Thunderhawk Blue together, just to make the transition from the Thunderhawk Blue to the Fenrisian Grey a little less extreme. 
Once I was happy with how the highlights were looking on the blue fabric, I moved my attention to the highlights of the skin. The good thing is you don't really need much paint when it comes to doing these highlighted sections because they require little surface area. So we're going to be making sure that all of the lightest areas are the highest parts of these skin sections. So in this instance, the knuckles and the top part of the bicep and so on and so forth. The neater that you can keep these highlights, the more you're going to make the contrast between the previous dark layer more emphatic. And that contrast really adds to the realism and the pop that you want from these miniatures. I then moved my attentions back to the metallic silver and I just added a brighter silver over the sections where I thought the brightest parts of the silver would be. Now because this is a gritty nasty model and this guy is going to be probably hanging out in the underhive somewhere, we don't need to get too bright with things, but just bright enough so it stands out on the tabletop. Certain parts of the model like the statue here are going to require edge highlighting and things like that, but the panels on the back are going to have the accent of the silver added to the middle of them so we can keep the contrast with the previous dark layers. And as with most of my videos when it comes to doing full scale 40k, I am making most of the video about the head. The head is a very important part of the model because it's generally the focal point of the model. And of course, a lot of different blending and a lot of different layers are going to be added into this head to add expression and realism so it really, really stands out on the tabletop. If you don't want to use a brilliant white, you can always use a bone color here just to make the eye sections and the teeth sections a little bit more realistic and a little bit more human. Kind of a stretch for the jean sealers, but you know what I mean. Then Screamer Pink is just going to be added to the tongue. We're not going to be doing any highlights or anything like that because I don't want to draw too much attention to the tongue. And everyone's favorite part of painting a model, the pupils of the eye. I'm using a size zero Da Vinci brush. You don't need to use a size zero as long as your brush gets to a very, very fine point. Any size, probably up to a size one or two can do the job too. Just make sure your brush isn't too loaded, but the paint flows off easily. A powerful resource for painting these heads is of course glazing. We're now pulling all these different tones and textures all over the place from the different parts of the contorted face at the front to the smooth areas at the top of the head. And we're trying to make sure that these transitions are smooth. So learning how to glaze is vitally important if you want to get these things to look as realistic as possible. Now, I'm by no means an expert, but you just take your time. And if you make a mistake, you can always go over it and start again. We're not dealing with washes or anything here at this point, so you can always go back to the previous darker phase if you're not happy with how you've added a highlight glaze or something like that. It just might take you more time. And if you really, really don't know how to glaze and you don't want to learn, you can always just do these things slowly, but with just layering paint on top of each other. You just have to make sure that you're very, very competent at making your blends as smooth as possible between the brighter and darker layers. The second brightest tone just after Pallid Witch Flesh we're going to be using is Kislev Flesh. This is a lovely pinky tone, nice and bright, and we're going to be focusing this bright tone around the eye socket and the top of the skull and places like the chin and areas like that where the sunlight would be catching them the most. Once I was happy with how these Kislev Flesh layers were sitting on the model, I moved over to the most extreme part of the highlighting process, which is with Pallid Witch Flesh. Now these, of course, once again, are going to be the smallest areas. And they're going to be our most acute highlight points on the face. On the video playback, the actual Pallid Witch Flesh looks very, very bright, but I promise you it's actually not that bright, but I have an LED macro light that's blasting down on this model, and it seemed to make the Pallid Witch Flesh way more bright than it actually was. It looks quite ridiculous, but actually when we get to the final presentation shots, you'll see that everything's sitting quite nicely. Bear in mind that with all of these things, you can take as much time as you want. You could spend a whole day just working on a face if you really wanted to. But when it comes to things like commission painting, and the same can be said for other jobs, especially freelance work, you want to be doing the best job you can, but as quickly as possible, because time is money. One little trick I have in my arsenal when it comes to being a creative person is always making sure to have the confidence to step away from something. I was getting quite blinded by what I was looking at when it comes to the pink tones and they needed to step away for a few hours from working on that. So I moved on to the headphones, which was a much easier thing to do. And sometimes when you achieve a much simpler goal, it gives you a bit more of a boost and a bit more confidence to go back to the more complex thing you had stepped away from earlier on in the project. And for these black headphone highlights, I'm doing the really nice process of using Dark Reaper and then mixing white into the Dark Reaper for the lighter and lighter parts where it's required. Using that blueiness from the Dark Reaper, I feel is a bit nicer than going with the bog standard 
gray when it comes over to highlighting blacks. I'm not really a big fan of highlighting blacks up with grays. Using different tones from dark greens or dark blues gives it a bit more of that grim dark feel, I think. And as you can see, those highlights are quite chunky, but we'll actually be making those highlights much more thin with a black layer later on, where we'll just make that highlight section thinner and thinner until it looks appropriate. Once I'd also finished those metallic details on the head, including the antenna, I moved on to a very, very minor detail of the Tyranid influence with this purple staining of the Drocky Violet on the back of the head. Of course, these are gene stealers we're talking about, so we have to give it that little Xenos flavor. Even though you're not going to see it on the very back of the head, you will see the side of the head on the side profiles of both sides of the model. And in order to make the skin seem strained and stretched under the influence of the Tyranids, we're going to be adding this rather nice red wash to make the skin look strained and almost stretched around the back of the head from all of the Xenos influence occurring here. And once you're happy with the skin looking suitably tortured, let's move on to some sub-assembly, where we're going to be using some plastic glue and super glue for some of the parts to assemble for the completion of the model. Now I recommend not using gloves when gluing things because you might want to be able to feel if there's glue on your fingers or not, whereas if you're wearing gloves, you can't. So just make sure you do that, be cognizant of where the glue is, and then let it dry. We're now moving on to painting some of these rope sections. I'm just using a very simple bone color as a base coat for that process. Now, you might have noticed that the rest of this section of the model has not been painted, but it was painted earlier. Well, it's just because this was the most suitable place to actually put this part of the video, because I end up doing the washing and the highlighting in the next sections. So I just wanted to clump all of this together. So please ignore the painted state or lack thereof of the rest of the part of this model. And because this was quite a light color, of course, it wasn't very opaque. So this took quite a few coats to get a nice even finish. You can use something like Xandri dust as a GW equivalent instead if you prefer. And once that's all bone dry, no pun intended, we're going to be moving on to this area that I forgot to film, which is just putting in an Agrax Earthshade wash, just to make the rope look a little bit more contrasty and realistic. Then we're going to be adding a final highlight to it, but I wasn't particularly happy with how bright the highlight was, so I then went over it with a filter of Seraphim Sepia to really finish it off. Now, of course, I'm slightly improvising here. I do recommend following actual tutorials, for example, GW ones, if you're new to the hobby, but sometimes you can be flexible once you're a few years in, if you want to start using different paints and something like that, like I'm doing here. I didn't know how it was going to look and I wasn't happy with it, so I adjusted on the fly. And once I'd added that Seraphim Sepia over the top of that exaggerated previous highlight layer, I was much happier. I then moved back over to the red section, so that's going to be the pipes, and the fabric with Wild Rider Red. We don't need too much of this paint, we're just going to be concentrating on extremities, whether it be the fabric edges or the very top of the pipes. Now, when it comes to something like the red sections, there's a variety of edges and surfaces to work with when it comes to highlighting them. So you've got the harsh edges of the sort of skirch capey section at the front and the back that are gonna require the edge of your brush, but then you might actually require the tip of your brush to do some painterly stuff when it comes to the pipe work. So just bear that in mind, not all surfaces are going to require the same paintbrush technique. As you can see, I'm making some very minute changes. We're not doing big, big things with this Wild Rider Red, just focusing on some very small areas and just taking our time not to make big, big abrupt changes because we don't want to make big, big mistakes. And as always, we're not necessarily putting this edge highlight across the entirety of an edge, but actually making sure that we pull the brighter colors to the ends of these edges, say the corners of these edges, rather than doing the entire edge. It gives it more contrast. Now at this point, it was quite crucial that I wanted to see all the different parts of the model together. So I decided to continue assembly just so I could make sure that all the colors and tones were matching across the entirety of areas that were being painted as sub assemblies previously. Now, because I'm using plastic glue, I didn't mind wearing gloves because obviously plastic glue isn't as severe as super glue, but of course you can still peel the paint with plastic glue, but I was very, very careful. And I also was at this point so deep in the model that I was more concerned about getting greasy fingers on the model than actually damaging the model with any excess paint on either my gloves or just around the area where the glue was in the first place. And thankfully there wasn't too many areas where there was an issue, but it's nothing that a paintbrush can't fix once everything has become dry.
I then moved on to making the Brassy Brass a goldy gold by using Retributor Gold. The brass tone is lovely for a dark section, but we needed to eventually get to that more yellow type of gold in the highlights, and so that's what we're addressing now. And because the model is fully assembled, I can really now see the difference between the skin tones from the head to the skin on the arms and the hands. So I can do a better job of matching the skin in the hands to the head. And so that's what I'm doing now with the Kislev Flesh highlight. And as always with highlights, I'm making sure that the end of my paint stroke is where I want it to be landing for the brightest point of the paint job. And the final thing that we need to do for the skin is add a final highlight of Pallid Witch Flesh for say things like the very top ridges of the fingers and the very chunky parts of the knuckles just to make the highlights the most emphatic we can make them while still looking natural. But if things are starting to look a bit too plastic or a little bit too bright, you can always go back in with a previous darker tone as a glaze and just glaze over the top of these bright sections and just bring the contrast down a little bit. As we draw to a close with this model, I decided to move over to the metallic silver sections for a final highlight for that, and I'm using Scale Colors Speed Metal. It is a great color, and it has a wonderful coverage considering the type of color that it is. But if you wanted to stick with the GW range, you can always use Stormbreaker or Runefang Steel. Just remember that even if you get lost with the model, you can always start again, or if you just need some direction, just jump onto YouTube, there's going to be someone who's probably painted the model that you're working on. This day and age is a wonderful time to be in the hobby because we've got such amazing resources at our fingertips that I could have only have dreamed of when I was a teenager back in the early 2000s. And to really round off the yellow gold tone that we're looking for, we're going to use Elven Gold, which is a lovely yellowy gold as a final highlight. I should have probably done this first in the highlight sections, but I decided to do it as one of the last things, which is actually highlight the grey body armour. We're just using model colour light grey, we're just skimming all of the edges with the side of the brush just to create that highlighted effect. It's very simple, this is pretty much just regular edge highlighting the whole way, nothing too complicated. Now this is going to be one of the longer sections that you have to do because of course there's so many intricate parts that you need to give an edge highlight to but just be very cognizant of where the tip of the brush is when you're using the side of the brush because sometimes you can be so focused on the side of the brush that you forget what's happening at the end of the brush and you could scrape right past a very important part of the model that you really don't want to have to fix at this late stage in the painting process. One thing to also be aware of is make sure that you don't have too much paint on the side of your brush. You might also want to do some test swipes of the brush on a piece of Kleenex first before applying it to the model, because sometimes you can end up with a situation where the paint is too thick on the brush, and you could have a big blob of paint that ends up on an edge highlight and really, really makes things uneven and not very nice, and once again, something that you have to fix. Now, I did mention earlier when I was painting the headphones that I prefer using dark blues and dark greens as a transitionary color to black highlights, but sometimes the gray just does the job that it needs to do. And when it comes to doing mild highlights for the pipes and regular highlights for the boots, it does the job just as I need it to do. And the second most trickiest part of this paint job after painting the head and the face is these hazard marks. But I recommend just going over the areas that you want to create the hazard marks with with some very, very thin down black paint, just in case you make some mistakes. It's much easier to fix a very, very transparent black paint rather than a thick black paint with the yellow that's already on the pipe. And then once you've sketched out where you want the black marks to be, then you can just go over with layers and layers of thin black paint as necessary. And just remember, don't get frustrated. You can always fix things. Just take your time and make sure that that black paint doesn't get too chunky. If you do make a bunch of mistakes, keep it as thin as you possibly can. And then once you're finished here, you can just paint the rim of the base, which we're going to be doing with Steel Legion Drab. But you can do it in any color that you want. Of course, my client wanted it in Steel Legion Drab, so that's what they're getting. And then once that's finished, I did a bunch of cleanup off the camera, and then we're on to the presentation. Of course, this is the model completed. If you made it this far through the video, thank you so much for watching until the end. I have three more Gene Steeler cult characters to paint for my painting commission, and I'll hopefully try and record episodes for those as well. But as always, until next time, I'm signing off from here at Bunker 6.